had to name the top five most influential women in history, who would be on your list? Uh, just to be safe, I'm assuming that after you write down the name of maybe your wife and your mother, you might go to some historical figures, maybe Queen Elizabeth or Amelia Earhart. Uh, if you're into politics, maybe Eleanor Roosevelt, Margaret Thatcher. If you're a person who's into sports, you might add the names uh, Pat Summit or Billie Jean King or some other great athlete, depending on how you're wired and what your interests are, uh, there'd be some variables from each person's list to the next person's list. But one name that I'm almost certain would appear on everybody's list is the name Rosa Parks. I've got this picture. Many of you will recognize this today. Uh, we celebrate her as a cultural icon, but that wasn't always her story. On this December 1st, 1955, you know the story, she got on a city bus in Montgomery, Alabama, and the way it was worked in those days is the seats in the back of the bus were reserved for black passengers, while the seats near the front of the bus were reserved for the white passengers, and the person driving the bus had the authority legally to ask people who were sitting in the back of the bus to give up their seats so that more white passengers could sit down if the bus was overly crowded. And that's what happened that afternoon. Rosa Parks worked a shift at a downtown department store, as it seems. So she got on the bus, and one little-known part of the story is that she was actually sitting already in the back section of the bus. She was in the first row of the back section that was normally reserved uh, for black passengers. But as the bus continued to make stops, continued to pick different people up, it got a little crowded, so the driver of the bus went back to the, the back section, the first row, and he asked her to move along with two of her friends. Her two friends got up quickly, moved further back in the bus, and Rosa Parks remained seated. The police were called. She was quickly taken into custody, and it sort of became this media firestorm. It started what became known as the uh, Montgomery Bus Boycott, which drew a lot of attention to the practice of segregation. Just a year later, in November of 1956, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that segregation was illegal. And a lot of people don't know this, but rather than receiving a, a hero's welcome, Rosa Parks actually paid a, a pretty heavy price. She lost her job in the eyes of many in the downtown business community. She became unhirable, and eventually she and her family had to move from Alabama to Michigan, where they struggled for years just to pay their bills, to escape the unrelenting harassment that was directed towards her. Despite all that, though, today we know her as the mother of the civil rights movement. You ever thought about this, how one courageous decision by a 42-year-old department store worker snowballed into something that, that literally changed the course of history in a very short amount of time. That's why if you were to make a list or you were to look at a list of the most influential people in history, her name would almost certainly be on it. As cool as that is, though, there are, there's another name that, that should be right up there with her, should be right up there with Eleanor Roosevelt and Margaret Thatcher and, and Queen Elizabeth. Unfortunately, it's a name that very few people know, and, and if you were to make your list of the, the five most influential women in history, her name probably would not be there, even though it, it should be. So if you have your Bible or your phone, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 16. This morning, we're going to look at the story of a woman who made one decision that literally changed the course of history in a very short amount of time and impacted your life even more than you could possibly imagine. And yet my suspicion is that if you were making a list of the most influential women in history, never mind the top five, probably not even the top 10, top 50, her name would probably not be on your list. For the last several weeks, we've been in this series that we're calling The, the Story of Us. And we're trying to take a fresh look at at where we came from as a, as a movement, as a church, in hopes of being better prepared for the future. Last weekend, we were in Acts 15, and we looked at this, this question that the leaders of the early church confronted that had the potential to, to split the church right down the middle in the opening days. And the question was, who gets to be a part of the movement? If you remember, the answer was anyone who turns to God. Rather than making it harder, they decided to make it easier, and they decided to welcome anybody who turned to God into the, the family of God. Then at the end of Acts 15, as, as sometimes happens, there is this disagreement that takes place between Paul and Barnabas. Now, up until that point, they spent a period of years working together to advance the movement, to advance the kingdom, but they have this disagreement, and they decide to go in different directions. So Paul hooks up with this guy named Silas, and they go one direction. 
Barnabas takes a young guy named John Mark who later becomes the guy that writes the gospel Mark and they go a different direction. So now you've got two teams instead of one traveling to all these places. So you get to Acts chapter 16, the opening verses, and Luke, the writer of Acts, tells us that Paul has his heart set on going to Asia. He wants to be the first person to preach the gospel in Asia. And they're, they're making their way towards Asia. They're stopping in all these little places, trying to start churches and share the message. But it's all, it's, as, as they're on their way to Asia, God steps in and redirects Paul away from Asia toward a place called Macedonia. I've got a map I want to show you. If you look at this map on the screen, Macedonia is up in the upper left-hand corner. Just put this in perspective uh, where this is today. It's in the southeastern corner of the continent of Europe. And the region that the Bible calls Macedonia includes the countries of Bulgaria, Serbia, North Macedonia, Albania, Kosovo, Montenegro, and Greece. So if you've ever been in that part of the world, that's where this is. So you get to verse 11 of Acts 16, and Luke lets us know that they've left Troas. Check this out. Uh, from Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day we went on to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. Now, something interesting here you can sometimes miss if you... If you read too fast, verse 11, instead of saying that, that Paul and Silas put out to sea, it says we put out to sea. And there's this shift in the next few chapters in which it goes from the third person to the first person, which lets us know that Luke, the guy who wrote this, has joined up with them. So now he's not just telling stories that he'd heard secondhand. He's an eyewitness. He's given us an eyewitness account to all these incredible things that are about to happen. So they leave Troas, and they wind up in Macedonia, and the first place they go is this this city called Philippi. Uh, Luke calls it the leading city of that district. Not only was it economically important because of its location, if you ever watch some of the old movies about the Roman Empire, it was also militarily important. This was the place, if you know your history, when during the, the second Roman Civil War that Mark Antony and Octavian defeated Brutus and Cassius for control of the empire if you've seen any of those movies. So what happens is you've got all these Roman soldiers who already live in this, this area. The battle's over. Instead of going back to Rome, they decide to settle in the area. And so it becomes sort of like this miniature version of Rome right there on the continent of Europe. It was also the home to the leading medical school in the ancient world, which is why Luke, the writer of Acts, who was also a doctor, wanted to go there. But one of the things you learn as you read through Acts is Paul's got this, this pattern that he follows everywhere that he goes. He goes to a new city, and the first thing he does is he shows up at the synagogue during one of their worship services. It's important to remember that before he became a Christian, Paul had been sort of a, a superstar in the Jewish world, and he still had that reputation. People still remembered him. So every time he showed up at one of their worship gatherings, people would sort of sit on the edge of their seat to, to listen to what he had to say. But now that he's entered into a, a new continent, there aren't as many Jewish people, and there's no synagogues, and so he has to figure out where to go. Uh, you see that in verse 13. Check this out. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. Now, just, just a point of emphasis here. One of the things that was true in the Jewish law, in order to have a synagogue, you had to have 10 different men from different families. So 10 family units. And if you didn't have at least 10, you couldn't legally start a synagogue. So what they would do is they would worship together sort of informally. They'd pick a place where everybody knew to meet, and they'd set the appointed time. And on the Sabbath day, they'd all go out there, and they'd read their scriptures together. They'd recite prayers together. And then if there happened to be a, a traveling rabbi or a religious leader in the area, he would come and, and share a few words. So Paul arrives in Philippi, he looks for the synagogue, he realizes they don't have one, so he figures out where they're meeting, and he crashes the party. Check out verse 14. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house, and so she persuaded us. Lydia is probably the most important woman in history that you've never heard of. 
You think about her story. If you've been tracking with us over the last few weeks, it would be easy to conclude that the, the story of the early church is kind of the, a story, you know, by men and for men and about men. In every chapter, the hero of the story has been a man. It's been Peter and Paul and Stephen and James and, and Barnabas. But then you get to chapter 16 and you discover that it was this, this one decision by this often overlooked lady that, that hardly anybody can name that opens up Christianity not just to a new region, not just to a new community, but to an entire new continent. And the moment that Lydia puts her faith in Christ, she becomes the first convert on the continent of Europe. In fact, you, you could say that this, this one decision by this mostly obscure woman is part of the reason that you and I live in a culture that's historically been dominated by Christianity rather than some other religion. A few weeks ago, we asked the question, how do movements move? And the answer is they move one person at a time. From the very beginning, that's how it's designed to work. One person tells another person, that person tells another person, then those three people go out and they tell three more people, and before you know it, the snowball kicks in, and you've got this little group of people who are all pulling together in the same direction, trying to invite more and more people to become a part of the movement. Now, here's what's so cool about this. If you're a person who's into history, then you know that what, what some people refer to as, you know, Western civilization, and I hope you don't have, like, flashbacks to some class you failed or, you know, slept through, but, but the, the term Western civilization, it refers to the culture that you and I live in, and, and for the most part, it's been defined by, by its adherence to historic Christianity. Now, I know a lot of people today especially try to act like that's not true. And they try to come up with these alternative backgrounds but if you really dig in you'll discover that that most of the values that we share uh, the way our education system is organized the way our calendars set up the practice of medicine the legal system the way we do science a lot of our art and music all of that can be traced back to its christian roots you may not recognize the name david aikman but you've probably read something that he wrote sometime in your life he was a writer for time magazine and for 25 years, he served as the, the bureau chief in Beijing, China. It's crazy. If you go back and look, the years he lived there seemed to, to coincide with the China's emergence as this global superpower that we know today. And back in 2002, he interviewed a, an unknown, uh, unnamed government researcher who for nearly 40 years had been been working on this top secret project for the communist government in which they took this group of a dozen social scientists in China and they tasked them with trying to determine why is it that, that Western culture seems to have dominated the world. Now, they were looking at it from a competitive standpoint. You know, what are they doing right that we can do better and sort of overtake them? And I want you to listen to what this scholar from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, which is kind of like their Harvard, it's kind of their premier school. I want you to listen to what he told David Aikman. Here's, his answer is a little bit lengthy, so, so hang on. Here's what he said. One of, the things, one of the things we were asked to look into was what accounted for the success, in fact, the preeminence of the West all over the world. We studied everything we could from the historical, political, economic, and cultural perspective. Now listen to this part. He said, at first, we thought it was because you had more powerful guns than we had. Kind of the old West mentality. Who's ever got the biggest guns, got the most, most influence. But then he said, we discovered that wasn't true. He goes on. Then we thought it was because you had the best political system. Next, we focused on your economic system. But in the past 20 years, we've realized that the heart of your culture is your religion, Christianity. That's why the West has been so powerful. He goes on, the Christian moral foundation of the social and cultural life was what made possible the emergence of capitalism and then the successful transition to democratic politics. We don't have any doubt about this. And then David Aikman asked him a follow-up question. He asked him, he said, have you seen any evidence of, of this playing out in your own country? I mean, you've reached these conclusions about the Western countries, but what about here? And I want you to listen to what he said. He said, studies by our own Chinese sociologists revealed that in rural areas where traveling evangelists, or what we would call missionaries, introduce Christian faith, opium addiction goes down, crime drops, and Christian families grow wealthier than their neighbors. 
that became sort of an aha moment for David Aikman, and he spent the next three years of his life studying the growth of the church in China, wrote a best-selling book, and did a series of lectures at Harvard. But here's what I want you to catch. All of that started because of Paul's obedience to the Holy Spirit to go to Macedonia and because of Lydia's acceptance of the message. Just like Rosa Parks' decision to not give up her seat snowballed into a cultural movement that changed the world to an even greater degree, Lydia's decision to become a follower of Jesus introduced the message of Christianity to a whole new continent in a way that continues to impact us today. And the tragedy is that most people, even most of us, wouldn't have recognized her name and probably would not have written her name down. See, mov movements always move one person at a time, but it never stops with just one person. One person becomes one family, one family becomes one neighborhood, one neighborhood becomes one community, and on and on it goes. So the question that I want us to think about for just a few minutes is how can we be the kind of people that help the movement move? How can you and I be the kind of people that the movement doesn't just stop with us, but, but we become the kind of people that, that pass it on to others and help it keep moving. There are three things that Lydia does here, and here's the first one. You lean, you lean into the message. Now, one of the frustrating things when you read Lydia's story is that they don't tell us a whole lot about her. There's only, she's only mentioned in a couple different places, but they, they do tell us enough to draw some conclusions. For example, verse 14 says she was a dealer in purple cloth. That lets us know that, that she was a, a fashion designer. In the ancient world, this purple dye was really hard to come by. It was, you had to extract it from a certain shellfish. And so because it was so labor intensive, it was really hard and really expensive to get. And so in that sense, she's, she's like a top shelf fashion designer. She's creating these clothes and she's selling them to the really rich people, the elite people. In that sense, she's kind of, you know, she's more like Coco Chanel than, than Rosa Parks. I mean, she's building a fashion empire. The other thing we know about her is that she was a worshiper of God. Now we read that and we think, okay, you know, she went to church once in a while, kind of like we do, but that was really a label that the first century would have read, hey, this is a lady that was a Gentile or a non-Jew that read the Old Testament and then worshiped with the Jews even though she was not a Jew. Another way to say is that she was a person who was trying to connect with God. She was a person that was, was trying to search for the truth. That's why when, when Paul shows up, man, she listens intently to his message. Rather than, rather than disengaging, she leans in. Rather than just assuming, hey, I've read the Old Testament, I've heard all this before. Rather than just saying, hey, I'm going to zone out for a while, she sits on the edge of her seat waiting and listening for God to speak to her. Now, one of the things that can happen, and this is always dangerous, and, and some of you are in this boat, if you grew up in church, right, if you went to church when you were a kid and, and you went to Sunday school, or maybe you've been coming here for a while and, and you had the same preacher for a while, there's this tendency to think, well, we've heard all this before. And there's this tendency, hey, the preacher's going to get tired of talking about it, and you kind of get tired of listening to it, and it just sort—it's easy to sort of zone out and and lean back rather than than lean in. I mean, nobody likes to to watch the same show over and over again. Nobody listens to the same song over and over again, unless unless it's a bluegrass song, then it's different. But you know, you know how it is. You, you want something fresh. You want something new. And there's this tendency where it's easy just sort of sit back and assume. Well, we've heard all this before. But to get the most out of the message, man, you have to train yourself to lean into the message. You have to train yourself to listen for that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. And when you do that, the most amazing thing happens. You look at the, the very next line in verse 14. It says, the Lord opened her heart. Now, I'll be the first to admit, sometimes I'm not a very good listener. But I'll tell you what I've learned. The Holy Spirit has never spoken to me. He's never opened my heart. He's never revealed something to me when I wasn't already listening. You have to listen first, and then he speaks. There's something about leaning in and, and listening with your heart that enables the Holy Spirit to, to speak to you in a way that you'll miss if you're zoned out or disengaged. So if you want to be a person who helps the movement move, you first have to learn to, to lean into those those moments. Here's the second thing. You have, to, you have to lead your family. So important. Check out verse 14. There's, like, there's this gap between verse 
14 and 15 that I want you to catch. Here's what it says. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to respond to Paul's message. There's this gap, and look what it says next. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. And it seems like there's, there's something missing, right? I mean, she's just now responded. She's just heard the message. She's put her faith in Christ. And the next thing you know, everybody in her family is getting baptized. How did that happen? It happens because Lydia went home, and the very first thing she did after she put her faith in Christ is she went home and she shared what she had experienced with those people that were closest to her in hopes that, that they would have the same experience. And so what started out as her faith quickly became their faith. Now, some of you grew up in families like, some of you grew up in families where following Jesus was like the main activity of the family. Others of you grew up in environments where other things took priority, and it could have been any, I mean, it could have been any number of things, education, sports, you know, hanging out at the lake, I mean, it could have been anything. And if that was your experience, I'm not here to beat you up, because nothing you can do about that, but I do want to ask you a question. How are you doing when it comes to leading your family. See, sometimes at church, we make these, these big statements about, you know, we're going we're gonna to change the world. Then we realize, well, we can't change the world, so we're going to change our community. And then it gets down to, we're going we're gonna to change our neighborhood. But you can't change anything, man, until you change what goes on at your house. Can't change anything until you change what takes place at your address. So the question is, how are you doing when it comes to leading your family? If you're a parent and we were to ask your kids, hey, what do you think your parents value most? What would they say? Would they talk about their GPA, their points per game, or having a transformed heart? How about this? If the people closest to you were asked to name what's most important to you, what would what would they come up with? Would they say, hey, he, he really enjoyed making money, he enjoyed working hard, uh, he enjoyed, you know, excelling at his job, or would they say that was a person that really enjoyed following Jesus? Let's take it a step further. When, when something happens to you and the people that are closest to you all gather at the funeral home and everybody's standing around and they're talking about you, what is it that they're, they're most going to remember about you? I, mean, I don't know how you feel, but wouldn't it be a tragedy if all they really remembered was what team you cheered for and what party you voted for and what you like to do in your spare time? Wouldn't that be terrible? Yeah, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. I do a lot of funerals. It's what most people talk about. But it's different when it's somebody that's done a good job leading their family. It feels different, and it sounds different. So let me ask you again, how, how are you doing when it comes to leading your family. Here's the last thing, so important. If you want to be a person that helps the movement move, you have to learn to leverage your position. Look again at verse 15 with me. It says, when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house, and she persuaded us. Every indication is that Lydia was a, a successful business leader. And because of that, she'd achieved this level of wealth. I mean, she lived in the kind of house and, and had the kind of resources where she could invite not just Paul, but his whole team to come and stay at her house and eat her food for an extended period of time. And it wasn't going to be an imposition. It wasn't going to bother her. You keep reading in Acts 16, and Paul and Silas get in one of these crazy situations. And they once again wind up spending the night in jail. But, but while they're in jail, this time, rather than, you know, suffering a beatdown, which they do, but they also wind up leading the jailer and his family to Jesus, just like they had Lydia's family. Then you get to the end of the chapter, and they're released from prison. I want you to listen to where they go, verse 40. It says, after Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. That's Luke's way of letting us know that Lydia's house became the place where the church in the city of Philippi met together. And years later, when Paul wrote the book that we call the book of Philippians, it was actually a letter to that church. And most people believe that once he wrote it, it would have been delivered to Lydia's address. 
And if you go back and you read through Philippians, it's only four chapters, you have five chapters, you go through and read that, and over and over again, he thanks them for sending him money. Most people think he's thanking them for sending him Lydia's money. I mean, they met in her house, and it was, it was her money. She was the person who leveraged her position to help the movement keep moving. Let me ask you, how would your life look different if you learned to, to leverage your position to help contribute to the growth and the expansion of the movement? What if, like Lydia, you figured out a way to use your house, the place where, where you live, as a tool to reach people? I'm not saying you have to you know, start a church and we're all going to meet at your house next week. And I'm not going to come stay with you, but you could do some things that would help you use your house, the place that you live, as a tool. You can invite people that you're trying to build a relationship over for a cookout. People in your connect group, people in your class, people that you want to grow closer to. Or you think about that family that lives down the street, and we've all got them, and you know they don't go to church anywhere, and you love to invite them, but you don't know them well enough, and it's kind of awkward. Man, just have a cookout and invite them over. Start building a relationship. Some of you, like Lydia, or in a position to use your financial resources to help expand the movement. It's not everybody, but, but some of you. Or some of you in a position, you could write a check today that would have an incredible impact, and you would never even notice that the money was gone. That's what Lydia did. You think about what ministries could we start, what, what debt could we eliminate, what missions could we partner with. If just a few people who've been successful, who've been blessed with, with financial resources decided to leverage those resources to help the movement keep moving. All of you have skills. Everybody in this room has a skill or a talent that, that you've been given by God that you could use to, to help us have a greater impact. Uh, if you have technical skills, we need people all the time, sound and in video. If you have a nice smile and you're capable of opening a door, we can use you as a door greeter. If you're, if you're a person who loves kids, Miss Anita would love to use you in FCC Kids. If you're a skilled musician, Jamie Reagan would love to talk to you. If you're mean and irritable, we'll put you on the security team. And there's a place there's a place for everybody. The point is that everybody here, everybody who calls this place home could do something to contribute to the help the movement expand. Some of you are in positions because of your job that, that could be leveraged in some creative ways to, to help people who, who may not be willing to come to church service. They may not be willing to even check one out a lot. Some of you work in office environments. not how this goes. There's somebody in your office, and every time that, that you see them coming, like you want to disappear, right? Because it's every day is like some new drama that they're involved in, and they want to share it with everybody. And as frustrating as that can be, that can be an open door to conversation. That can be an open door to say, hey, I know that's a mess, but I'd love to pray with you. Others of you work with the same people for a really long time. And you've built some relationships to the point where you can have some conversations that, that go beyond, hey, what are we eating for lunch? And what did you do last night? And what's your weekend look like? A lot of your teachers or school employees, and every day you're surrounded by literally, I mean, literally hundreds of people, hundreds of students who have nobody else in their life that's going to be any kind of positive influence and point them in the right direction except you. You've been given a front row seat to impact people. Now, here's my question. Do you think it's possible that God has placed you where you are in terms of where you live and what you have and what you do and who you're around to do more than just draw a paycheck and hopefully retire one day? Do you think it's possible that God has put you where you are in terms of where you live and who you have the opportunity to be around because he wants you to do more than just wait till 5 o'clock so you can go home and then go home on Friday and have a good weekend? I mean, Lydia was a woman. You look at her story. She leveraged her position in the business world to provide the place, the resources, and the leadership that was needed to help the movement expand, not just to a new community, but to an entirely new continent. And it changed the world that you and I live in in ways that we're still trying to understand. And yet, most of us didn't know her name before we walked in here. I have another picture that I want to show you. One of the ironies of history is that Rosa Parks was not the first person to ever be arrested on a Montgomery City bus for refusing to, 
give up her seat on that bus. A full nine months before the incident that everybody knows about with Rosa Parks, the 15-year-old girl that you see on your screen was arrested under nearly the exact same circumstances. She was riding home from school. The bus got crowded. The bus driver came back, asked her to move. Her friends got up and moved immediately, and she remained seated. Rather than calling the cops immediately, though, the bus driver waited until the next stop where he knew a policeman would be located. He came on and put handcuffs on a 15-year-old girl and took her to jail. He never got the media attention that Rosa Parks' story got. In fact, if you go back and look, there was only just the, the briefest mention of it in the, the city newspaper. But one little-known fact about the Rosa Parks story is that she and her husband on Sunday afternoons were volunteers at a local church's youth ministry that met at 3 o'clock every Sunday afternoon at a Baptist church in downtown Montgomery, Alabama. And Claudette Colvin, the 15-year-old girl that you see on the screen, was a member of that youth group and was close to Rosa Parks and her family. And in recent years, historians of the civil rights movement have picked up on this connection, and they, they now claim that it's likely that when the driver of that bus asked Rosa Parks to give up her seat, that, that she thought back to, to nine months earlier and the courage of a 15-year-old girl that's, that it was part of her youth group that stayed in her seat and faced the consequences. See, how do, how do movements move? They move one person at a time. And here's my challenge to you and my challenge to myself. Will we be the type of people? Will you be the kind of person that helps the movement move? I mean, who knows? Maybe you do something that gets a lot of attention. And everybody knows about it, and it impacts a lot of people. Or maybe you'll do something that hardly anybody notices except for the people who are closest to you. And maybe it'll inspire them so much that one day in the future, when they're given a piece of paper and they're asked to name the people that influence them the most, they might even write down your name. I mean, it could be that, like Lydia, you could do something that could impact not just your kids, but your grandkids and your great-grandkids. I mean, nobody knows what the ripple effects could be. But here's what I do know. For the movement to keep moving, we've got to keep moving. And for us to keep moving, you have to keep moving. So if you're here and you're ready to move, we'd love to help you. Some of you, your next step is putting your faith in Christ, becoming a follower of Jesus. We'd love to help you do that. Others of you, may be time to place your membership here at FCC, uh, officially join the team. Others of you may just want to pray with somebody. You might want to talk to somebody. David and I would, would love to talk. We had several people last weekend that prayed with us. Um, but whatever it is, we want you to know we're here to help you, but you have to take the first step. I want you to stand. For, for a lot of you, the step that you need to make is you need to decide that tomorrow morning that alarm clock is going to go off. It's going to go off at the same time it always goes off. You're going to walk into the same kitchen that you always walk into. You're going to eat the same cereal you always eat. You're going to go put on the same clothes you always put on. You're getting the, the same car. You're going to drive to the same job, and you're going to spend the day surrounded by the same people that you're always surrounded by. And from the outside looking in, tomorrow is going to look like everything is the same as it's always been. But from the inside out, it could all be very different. It might look the same, but it could be very different because instead of just collecting a paycheck, instead of just watching the clock so it reaches a certain point so, so you can go home that night and do what you really want to do, instead of all that, you could spend tomorrow and the next day and the day after that looking for creative ways to leverage your position, to leverage where you are and what you have and who you're around to help the movement move how do movements move they always move one person at a time but here's the challenge somebody's got to be the person somebody has to take the first step and if you're here and you say man I'm tired of living the same and I want to contribute to something that's bigger than I am 
and goes back way further than I go back and will launch into the future and go much further than I'll ever go. You have that opportunity, but you have to do it. Let's sing together.